All right. It's a great day, everybody. This is Gavin Mayo. We got a special guest on today, uh, patent attorney David Pierce from out in the UK, who was sitting in the courtroom at the uh, Copa versus Craig Wright trial uh, last week. And we uh, had the opportunity to connect and he gives me the uh, great privilege of, of getting to interview him here in person. So David, uh, pleased, pleased to meet you. And I would love to give you the floor and just tell us a little bit about who is, uh, who is David Pierce? Pleased to meet you too, Gavin. Uh, it was a surprise to get the invite, but yeah, it's great. Um, I'm a, as you said, I'm a patent attorney in the UK. I'm a qualified, we call chartered patent attorney in the UK and also a European patent attorney. So I, I do work before the UK patent office and the European patent office. I've been doing that for about 20 years. Um, before that, I've been training as an engineer. I've got a PhD got research experience, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's, you know, it's the patent attorney job that I've been doing for, for 20 years. And I also, uh, for the last, yeah, for about that, for about that period, I've, I've been blogging as well. Um, I got involved in an IP blog called the IP cat or IP cat, uh, in 2006, thereabouts. Uh, and within a year or two after that, I, uh, started blogging under the name Tufty the Cat. Uh, you've probably seen that name pop up, Gavin. I, I know you mentioned uh, there were cat people in the court last week. <laughs> I spotted that one. Yeah. That was, that was me sitting next to Hodlinot. Yes, so. you and Hodlinot were sitting in the court together. Exactly. That's that's why that came up. <laughs> yeah. So so the two space cats. I, I've been I've been blogging as as a cat since since Tufty the Cat was was alive. Um, he died in 2012, but I've, I kept the name going just just because I can. So it, it's not a secret. I, I, well, I'll tell you a little story. If if I mean we've got we've got a little bit Please, of time. Take your time. A little back, background story is um, at, shortly after I started blogging as as Tufty the Cat, I was commenting on European patent law aspects, so pretty esoteric areas of patent law. In in, in this case, it was a Software patenting was a big issue in the 2005 to 2010 area. Uh, lots of people against it. Lots, of, well, lots of people very noisily against it. All the open source crowd, um, people like Richard Stallman, um, various people are very much against Europe granting patents for software. I didn't really have any opinion, but I, I was looking more at the at the case law and filed what you'd call an amicus brief at the European Patent Office when there was a big case involved. Um, and that got picked up quite a lot. So I got some attention. Uh, and then I found out that the, there was a, a very distinguished law lord, Lord Hoffman, uh, who uh, in, in the UK was involved with some really high, um, high profile cases over his career. He was doing presentations around the world uh, and he was putting up a picture of my cat <laughs> and, and no one knew who I was. No one knew who Tufty the Cat was. And, and and he came to Birmingham where I, where I work one day, and I went to see this presentation. And it, and yeah, he put a picture of the cat up, uh, and and everyone was was and he was he was put it up because he agreed with my legal reasoning, which I thought was quite flattering. And then at the end of at the end of the talk, he um, finished his talk, and, and I thought I've, I've got to go and introduce myself. <laughs> so. I introduced myself to this law lord uh, and said, uh, uh, "Excuse me, I'm, I'm, I actually wrote that. I'm Tufty the cat. He's my cat." <laughs> and it was, it was a great moment. He was, he was all, you know, traditional English gentleman. Oh dear boy, that's lovely. You know, anyway, so I, I, I stuck with that name for a while and then got involved in. Uh, I got interested, put it that way, in in Bitcoin a few years ago. No, I'm not an OG by any means, but. Uh, got interested in Bitcoin actually through what we're here to talk about through the Craig Wright story. So uh, your interest came from like, take me back to like where your interest started. Was it how, how did it come about? Hard, hard to pin down, but I, I sort of vaguely remember because people keep asking me this. I'm thinking, well, was it, was it from that? Because it, I think it was 2016, maybe 2017 people started noticing that there was this company called, N chain or encrypt they changed the name about that time and they were filing a lot of patent applications uh 
you know, it, we, we were seeing dozens and dozens being filed at the UK Patent Office. Uh, and we know this started in February 2016. That was the very earliest one was, was filed in February 2016. Um, and I don't know if you, how much you know about patent the procedure, but patent applications don't generally get published until 18 months after the filing date. So all these patent applications you could see had been filed, and, and you could see on the UK register there were, you know, an application had been filed and filed by Encrypt, Enchain, um, but no one knew what they had in them. They just had a title. So there was something to do with blockchain, cryptography, whatever. There were lots of them. So there was a bit of interest, but no one could figure out what was going on. And it wasn't until end of 2017 that they started to get published. And then uh, I probably lost interest for a bit and then picked it up a couple of years later when there were lots that were being published. Uh, and I've just sort of kept an eye on them ever since. And, and in parallel with that, I started learning about, actually, I'm probably one of the few people who've, who can say Craig Wright has, has, has been instrumental in me learning about Bitcoin. So Yeah. Uh, seems a bit odd, but uh, yeah, re reading the patent applications it led me to um, look into more about the background. So I ended up reading lots of books on it, ended up getting Andreas Antonopoulos's book for our, our Mastering Bitcoin, which is great. Um, and now I, you know, I'm, I'm by no means a, a into the code or anything, but I, I know a fair bit about it. So, uh, yeah, but from the patent perspective, that's where I, I was coming from. Wow. All right. So it sounds like, uh, you know, you first heard about the 2016 and then the patents, that's interesting knowledge. So you're saying the patents weren't actually public until around end of 2017. And that's when you finally started realizing what, what they said. It sounds yeah, like. So that the, the very first ones will have been published in August 2017. That's right, isn't it? Two plus six. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So And then they, they just published at the same rate as they were being filed 18 months previously. And that's just kept going for the last seven years. Hmm. Uh, so you lost, you lost interest for a couple of years or whatnot and got on with life, it sounds like. And then now you've yeah. picked back yeah. up. Well, I, I, yeah, perhaps just looking at what I was blogging about over those years. I mean, I, I just tend to pick up on things that that seem interesting to me. So esoteric aspects of law, usually European law, or if somebody, somebody's trying to patent something crazy, I'll have a look at that. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll lose interest for a few months and maybe just get on with the job. I do have a day job to do. So nobody's paying me to do this blogging. Um, so, yeah. Well, all right. Before we change subjects, I really got to ask you about these patents. I haven't read the patents uh, there in, in the UK. And so I, I, I have no, I have no uh, perspective. So it sounds like you've read a lot of them and obviously you're, you're an expert on that. So what can you tell us about the end chain patents that you've seen? Well, I, I can give you a general picture to start. Um, there are uh, just over, well, of the ones that have been published, uh, bearing in mind you've got this 18-month time lag, there are now over 500 um, filings, let's put it that way. So what you start with is you have an invention, so you write down that invention, and then the patent attorney will turn that into a patent application. So that's then what gets filed, at, in this case, at the UK Patent Office. And then 12 months after that, it sort of balloons out into... Well, it doesn't at that stage. It got, they, what they do is they file an international application, and then that international application then turns into applications at the European Patent Office, the US Patent Office, Japan, China. So one initial application then turns into maybe eight, ten different ones. So uh, this is this is where you you've probably heard thousands of patents and applications from Enchain. This is where that number comes from. So that they start off with 500 sort of initial filings, and then those can turn into, let's see, what did I say, eight times? So 4,000 applications around the world, which that, that's the rough ballpark. So it's it's an enormous patent portfolio, um, especially for a small company. I, I don't know the headcount, but it's, you know, a couple of hundred people. So it's that's... You know, just looking at it from a patent attorney's perspective, that 
that's quite impressive and and sounds very expensive. Yeah, you know, I know well, how much these things cost. That's very expensive. What well, what does it cost to to do a patent like that? You know, on average. Uh, well, just I can one. only give you ballparks. Just Ballpark. if you have a, a simple invention, the the initial review of the invention disclosure and getting that filed might cost say five thousand pounds for a, for a fairly simple one. It might cost ten thousand pounds for if it, if there's more work involved. If it's complicated, and a lot of these are complicated, so you know that that's a sort of rough region you'd be looking at. I think. So let's say ten thousand pounds, just off the top of my head. So five hundred times that, and, and they filed more than that. Um, then you've got another, I don't know, five ten thousand pounds a year later. Then you've got another five thousand pounds times eight a year and a half later. It, it's it's a lot of money. A lot of money. So it's definitely they've there's they've got skin in the game, so they believe they've 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 made a significant investment, clearly. So yeah. Is there yeah. is there any uh what what is the effect of patents? You know, what what is the what is the, the effect of those patents? I guess that would be a, probably a better question. Oh uh, well in, in themselves they don't do anything. Um they are well, what, what do people file patents for, I suppose, is, is the question. You know, people file patents to um, secure investment is, is one, one thing. So if you, if you want to attach value to what you're doing as a company, so you're coming up with new things, putting them on the market. If someone wants to invest in that company, they, they want to be sure that they've got some sort of protection. So it could either be a brand protection, you've built up a brand and that's where the value attaches or with technology, it can be a, we've come up with a new technology and that we we protect that by getting a patent. So we want to stop anyone else doing the same thing. So that's that's often why why people will file for, for patents. Um, and and I'm, I'm guessing that will be a primary aim for what Enchain are doing. You know, they, they want to develop technology and they want patents to protect that technology from other people copying it and, and taking it and, and using it um, for other purposes. So if they've invested all that money, they would naturally expect to either protect that money that they will earn by using that patented technology, or they would license it, or maybe both, or they would license it to other people so they can use that technology. And I think that I mean, it's it's difficult to figure out what the internal strategy of a company is, but I would imagine there's, and I've I've seen some, seen and heard some comments about how what Enchain are trying to do, and I think it's the latter. I think it's the intention is to build up a big portfolio and then eventually license it. Mm. All right. So now uh, I want us to ask about the questions, but on to the trial. Are you watching the trial every day, or just kind of tuning in here and there, or what's your? Well, I was I was there Monday to Thursday last week, uh, sitting in the court. Um, God, it was hot. It was ridiculously <laughs> hot. It was, I don't know how the lawyers cope with it. It, it. it was. I don't know. They had some some problem with the air conditioning over Christmas or something. It was, it was just. It was just crazy that all all this money that's been spent to get to this point to appear in the the most powerful court in the land and <laughs> they can't they can't get the air conditioning right. <laughs> yeah, so that, that was that was ridiculous, uh, and it was yeah, it it made it, it must have made concentrating on it quite quite hard for some people in there. But all all the lawyers did an amazing job just staying with it for the whole time. So that. My that was my initial impression. I thought that both sides were, you know, they were professional and, and they kept their jackets on and everything. And, and I was I was sweltering in the back in <laughs> shepherd's <laughs> leaves. Um, yeah, so it it was it was really interesting. I I don't get to to see court proceedings very much. Um, I don't do litigation. Um, I I just do patent prosecution and and things relating to that. So it was. Uh, yeah, it was fascinating to see. Um, there was, sorry, I just, I just thought of a, a, a point that I thought need, needs to come up at, at some stage because what I, 
what I also did on the Friday when I was back home, I'd got access to the the remote link. So I guess that's what you've been you, watching. The, yeah. Uh, this Opus Two system. Opus so you, Two. So you get you get the screen and 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 they're, they're quite good with the. I, I talked to the guys in the room. They were they were in the in the back corner sorting this thing out and they were uh, editing it on the on the fly. So doing the production thing with the camera angles and things. So it's it's quite a professional job. Although the the streaming didn't always work. Um, but yeah, I noticed there was there's quite a quite a big difference between being that the impression that you get being in the court in person and watching it on the the video stream i mean for to start with on on the video stream you don't see the documents which is which is a bit awkward because a lot of the time they're talking about documents do you see this <laughs> jonathan hoff was saying do you see and craig was saying yes or i do there was a lot of that um so they're, they're showing up, showing this particular document, usually a particular passage, and you don't get to see that on the video stream, which so it, it's hard to keep track of it. It's also hard to keep track in the courtroom because the screens, are, although they're big screens, they're quite far away. So a lot of the time that this is the tiny details they were trying to show, I just couldn't see what was going on. There, there was there was one with a some flow chart. It was just garbled on the screen. I couldn't tell what it was at all. And only once I got back home and, and opened the document itself, I, I realized, ah, that's what it was. And then it makes sense what they were talking about. So if you're just watching the video stream, it's it's, it's quite hard to, to keep track unless you've already got the documents to hand. But also, I was when I was in the courtroom, I think that the, the main point is when I was in the courtroom, I was behind all the speakers. So the only person I was face on with was, was um, Sir James Mellor. Uh, stand uh, sitting up well actually standing for most of the time at, at the at the back of the court um but the two the two sides barristers so jonathan hoff on the on the left and lord grabiner on the right they they were just standing up facing facing the judge so i, I was i was there with with their back to me and so I, I was just listening to what they were saying and trying to see what was on the screens and the documents uh, and then and then craig wright was Way over the other side of the of the room when he was on the stand Tuesday to Thursday, um, sort of half hidden behind a, a monitor. So uh, I wasn't really seeing any facial expressions. OK. Um, and, and so th as a consequence, I was just listening to what they were saying and trying to see the documents and trying to figure out what was going on, what points they were making whether that was being addressed you know all, all that stuff and then when i got i was watching it here on friday just with the video screen and you've got really clear views of jonathan hoff and of craig wright and whenever sir james Mellor comes on the screen you get him as well and and you get just such a different impression because because what you're looking what you're doing then on the video screen is your you, you're looking out for body language more. So I, I could see what Craig was doing is whenever he was asked a question, he was his initial reaction would be to go like that and then start off and, and answer it. So there's sort of that confident breathe in and then go. So there was that body language. And then Jonathan Hoff was was standing there with his hands on the on the lectern. You know, he was standing up the whole time. And and he was he was shuffling around a bit. Yeah, you must have seen that. So it's oh, yeah. constantly moving side to side. And, and there was a lot of um, glasses on, glasses off, checking notes and clearly thinking a lot on the fly. There, were, there was a lot. He was concentrating enormously, trying to get all these points through. But when you're watching it on the screen, you, you're noticing all this body language and, think, and, and the impression that you get is very different in terms of, well, who's winning? Because if you mm -hmm. just go by the body language, <laughs> then, then you'd go. If you're not, if you're just not listening to anything anyone's saying, and you're just going by the body language, you think, "Well, Jonathan Hoff looks very uncomfortable. He looks like he's, you know, unsure and, and he's acting shaky and everything." And Craig's just sitting there, relaxed, and he's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you can't see them, I couldn't really see their expressions when I was there in person. Uh, and I was just listening. All I, all I was doing really was listening to their words, 
you get a very different impression. I'm not I'm not not saying which which way is the impression that you get, but you, you guess that you know you might you might say if you were paying more attention to the body language, you might think Craig was winning. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to the words, you might think the other side was winning. So because I, I I was trying trying to trying to think because I was watching you know listening to some of the BSV people were there as well. There was a there's a guy who was there the whole time. Um, what do you call himself? Uh, yeah. He 369. goes by three six nine BSV. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so he's there with his. I'll not describe him because he you know might want to stay anonymous. But yeah, that recognised him each day. Very recognisable figure. So he he's there. Nice chap. He was he was chatting with with some other guys who were there. Uh, and I think he was he was getting a very different impression to everyone else. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there was it was all very it was all very friendly in the courts. No no one was angry with anyone else. We were all talking to each other when we were queuing up before the the court opened. I had some nice conversations with with people who were wouldn't be on my side, as it were. <laughs> but that's fine. It, it was it was great. So it was all sort of a camaraderie. That's yeah. That's really what it's all about, sportsmanship. And I had a, I had yeah. a great yeah. call with this uh, with Brett the other day. We talked about sportsmanship. As a matter of fact, I just want to plug this right now. Well, <laughs> I actually petitioned to host a roundtable at this uh, London blockchain convention, which is going to be like end of May, where I get attorneys together. And we talk about this case from all sides and it's, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'm putting a plug in there. Hopefully they approve it. And it would be great to have like Hoff and, and, and then Lord Gravenu and everybody come together. If the case is over, I mean, it's a, it's a Hail Mary, right? But uh, it would be cool if, if we could. <laughs> well, you, you can ask. <laughs> you can ask. I'm not sure you'd get, probably, sure you'd get Jonathan Hoff or, or um... probably, yeah. Lord Gravenu. Yeah. Lord Grabbing yeah. yeah. He didn't like being there at all. Last oh, week. it seemed like he was super hot. So yeah. let's can we talk a little bit about the procedures that are going on in the trial? And I want to ask you before I forget, um, you know, and when before, so this is just skipping ahead with what just happened today. Back to the yeah. patents really quick. Wright made this bold claim. Uh Hoff at, in closing is basically on the stand today. Did you watch today? Yes. Yeah. Did. Okay. Most of it, yeah. Most of it. So you probably remember when Hoff uh was in his just in his closing with uh, with Wright, he he said, So if you if you lose Dr. Wright, are you still gonna go around saying I'm Satoshi, I'm Satoshi? And and Wright says, uh, you know, it's not important to me. I don't need to be Satoshi, but if I lose, then I got 60 patent litigation cases ready to go uh right away. It, you know, is that a and hmm. uh, you know, in your perspective, is that a is that a possibility is he is he bluffing i mean what is the what does he mean by that well i i can't tell you the specifics but i know that they do have um let me see uh 96 granted european patents hmm. so yeah if they want to if they want to start infringement proceedings on 60 of those they've, they've got the numbers the question is whether anybody is infringing them right um, that would take a, a a court to determine. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it it's not it's not beyond the realms of possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I've looked at quite a few of these. Uh, I have opinions, but it's difficult to determine whether anyone's infringing anything unless you see the the alleged infringement. Now you've got to get into the specifics. Now you, you've got to see what people are doing. There was there was a lot of not a lot, but there was it. it Taproot has been mentioned. Uh, Craig mentioned it a few times today uh, in relation to his patents or patents, as he calls them. Uh, we, the rest of the world calls them patents. But <laughs> yeah, he's he's a particular one. Um, so so yeah, that maybe he thinks that some of some of his patents cover Taproot. To be honest, I don't know the details of how Taproot works. Uh, it's pretty complicated. Um, so, but I'd, I'd like to see which ones he has in mind. Um, and I'm sure other people would as well. So you only get to find out, you know, once the patent number gets mentioned and then people can start looking seriously. Um, if there is 60 out there that someone's infringing, I'd, I'd be very surprised, but who knows? Hmm. 
and that there will be i mean this and i'm just i'm just looking at europe i'm a european patent attorney i'm not going to start looking at us or china or japan or wherever um but i'm sure there are at least as many patents granted in the us probably on similar or overlapping areas So I, I know that they've got lots of granted patents in the U.S. All right. Well, that's interesting to know. So it may be a, that sounds like, well, that's what he said was his strategy if he loses the case. So let's. Yeah, um, on, sorry, on, on that on yes. that point. that Yeah, going back, going back to what Jonathan Hoff was saying in his closing, because mm -hmm. when he started, um, it was a sort of a rounding off thing, wasn't it? He was getting, he'd done all his questions and then that was a sort of rounding off and, and asking him, about the future and, and i thought what what's why is this why is he asking these questions because they're completely different to everything he, he'd done up till then uh, and i thought ah it, it just dawned on me while i was asking them that this is part going back to the particulars of claim copa's particulars of claim included an injunction to stop craig um saying that he's satoshi effectively and issuing proceedings on the basis that he's Satoshi. Um, and I think those questions were, put, were directed at that particular point. So th that's why he was asking, if you lose, would you go ahead and, and issue proceedings effectively as Satoshi? Because that's making it clear to the judge that he would. So yeah. they're trying to say that, yeah, that listen to this judge we want this is to justify an injunction to stop him just anyway that that's that that my, my take on that yeah it was just a short a short few minutes at the end but yeah. it's it sort of clear that, that 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 underlined the one of the points that they were asking for seems like a a, a far stretch well i don't know that sounds for a rather rather a, a far-reaching injunction to potentially enjoin him from filing patent litigation wouldn't wouldn't you say that would be a, no, a separate I, no uh, they, they wouldn't no, it wouldn't be able to do that because it wouldn't be him okay. anyway. It would be, it would be him taking any action or, or saying, <laughs> it, an injunction could be quite strong. Uh, it could be an injunction to prevent him doing anything, pretending, uh, purporting to be, put it that way, Satoshi. That wouldn't wouldn't cover patent litigation. That that's a different thing. That would be initiated by Enchain or whoever takes on or licenses these patents. Okay. That makes That's sense. a different thing. I mean, it's always it, it, it's it's important to bear in mind that this case is not about patents. Right, not a, at all. I, yeah. I see a lot of comments from the BSV side saying Copa is just is just after Craig's patents. Yeah, and, and I, that has nothing to do with this case. And and it's it's just simply not the case. It's um the, the I did a, I did a check on the particulars of claim just because someone someone said something on on Twitter as as usual. Um, uh, and they said Copa's only after Craig's patents, and I thought, let me just check. It's yeah. just in just in case you're right. I need to check. So I went back to the particulars of claim that was filed two years ago, uh, and and just did this word search for patent, and it's there three times. So first time it's in the name of the what Copa is, which is the Crypto Open Patent Alliance. Second time it's again in the name of Crypto, Crypto Open Patent Alliance. Third time, it's in the the 1988 Act, uh, the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, 1988. But that's because this case is about copyright. Mm. So it's copyright in the Bitcoin white paper. That's that's all the COPA would claim was about, really. Copyright in the Bitcoin white paper. COPA wants an injunction. Uh, sorry, not an injunction. It wants a de de declaration of non-infringement. Yeah. So they want a the judge to declare. You do not infringe any rights that Craig Wright has because he's not Satoshi and therefore didn't write the white paper. So that's effectively what they what they want. And then all these other cases pile in on the same the identity issue because um, they have that in common. And then is it is it is it right to say that Craig Wright's action is to state that he wants the court to declare that he is Satoshi, and then he's got the other. Uh, this passing off claim with BDC Core. Can you talk a little bit about those two? Yeah, well, I mean that that would be the the other the other possibility. So it it is a binary outcome, really. The the judge either declares that um, he is or he isn't. I mean, there's nuances in how it's expressed, but effectively, that's all. That's what's going to come out. It's going to be one or zero. Um, 
And then that's why these other cases have been tied to it, because you've got the Kraken and Coinbase cases, which are on hold because of this identity issue, because they're, they're about another IP right called passing off. I don't know if you know about passing off, but... Please, uh, just... Well, I, I I would like to you to explain it, please. Well, just just very briefly, do you, did you have, do you have uh, Jif Lemon in the states? No. No. Well, we we have um, there was a famous case that that sort of established the rules in the UK on passing off uh, that involved Jif Lemon. Now it, it's um it was a lemon juice uh, in in a container, a plastic container that was the shape and size and color of a lemon. Uh, and it was under the brand name Jif Lemon. And someone someone came along and started selling lemon juice in a plastic container the shape and size of a lemon, but called it something else. And and Jif Lemon decided to sue, it was Reckitt Benkiser, I think it was the company. Um, they decided to sue this other, other company um, because they were passing off as their product. So it wasn't a brand name, it was all the appearances of without the brand name. Um, and and they they won in the end because it was you know that there was a um, there was the similarity there was a mischaracterization and there was damage so there were various I forget the exact criteria but there's a series of steps that you have to uh, pass to establish a case of passing off and that's what the Kraken and Coinbase roughly that's what they're about uh, and that it, that it, in um, in Craig Wright's claim it's it's about um, Kraken and Coinbase supposedly passing off Bitcoin as something else, okay? To put it very simple terms. Um, the other cases involve... The BTC Core case, because they were up today. Yeah. that The other case involves um, another copyright claim and database right. So the, the other copyright claim is in the bit, what's what's been termed the Bitcoin file format which was never termed that before this case was filed, but it's supposedly in the, uh, do you know anything about how blocks are structured in Bitcoin? Which will be the same in, in BSV as well. Please, please, uh, please inform us. So it, every, every 10 minutes, as you know, a block is created on average. And in that block, there's, there's data that's structured in a certain way so that, so that all the nodes can read it. Uh, and the Bitcoin file format case is is about the the structure of that data so not the data itself so that the way that that data is structured in every block the and and the the case is about copyright in that structure itself so not in the data but in the structure of the, the file format and that that got um initially rejected by the high court i think that was james Mello last year yeah and then he said he said there was no uh copyright didn't subsist in that because you couldn't tell from the block what the structure was, you had to know from another source. So you had to be you had to be told how to read it effectively, because it's just ones and zeros. There's not there's nothing to tell you what's in there. Um, but then that got sent to the court of appeal, and and they said, well, yeah, there is actually. So they sent it back down. And there is a case to be tried. So that's that's that got added onto the list of things to decide, which is again dependent on Craig actually owning it. So any any copyright in the Bitcoin file format is dependent on, to some extent, who who created Bitcoin in the first place. There's other Makes questions sense. as well, but that's complicated. Uh, right, and so, then the ahead. other one with database rights. So the the, oh. the rights there's a separate right in Europe, hmm. and, and I'll try and keep this short because it's quite it gets quite complicated. But it's, there's an interesting point there because the database rights is about the data itself. So the data that's in the blocks. Um, that you could argue that there is a database right, which which is only a European Union right that was came into force in the late 90s. So it doesn't apply anywhere outside Europe. And it still applies in the UK because we kept that bit after we left the EU. Um, and and that's that's to do with the data itself and, and who owns that database right. Uh, and interestingly, James Mello, when he was a QC earlier on in his career, was involved in in possibly the, the 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 leading case in database rights about 25 years ago, involved involving horse racing um, data. 
so he's like the world expert on database rights so uh that's that's an interesting aspect to it but again that that's that's held up because of this identity issue so i'm, I'm sure he would he would be very interested in in hearing that case and uh i yeah i, I had the the privilege of, of discussing aspects of it with him at dinner this time last year uh, uh completely coincidence I, I i did go out to to dinner with james miller before he, the, these cases really started and um, we talked about database rights and yeah didn't talk about the case at all but um and yeah. what's he like as a man he's great it, he's it, it's kind of like how he comes across in court it, he's just a a really friendly really open really really nice character uh, a gentleman um and clearly, as, as you've probably seen from the, the court proceedings, he's scrupulously fair. Uh, I think, you know, what, thinking about the, um, I think it was on, was it on the second day or first or second day when there was a discussion about whether there was more documentary evidence that could be brought in? Yeah, I think it was, was it right 11? The, the, it, there were 14 statements from Craig Wright and they were they were discussing whether this right 11 was going to be allowed in because it was very very late um and in the end there was back and forth and there were, uh, as long as you have bits of this thing redacted there was we don't know what was in there but it was something that people didn't like and in the end he he you know balanced it up by saying I'll allow it in provided it's redacted as long as the other side get the chance to to get their expert in and have a look at it and submit the report. So it was very, very fair. And he could he could have, and he, he did say that, you know, in any normal case, I wouldn't, there's no way I will be allowing this stuff in because it's far too late. But I accepted that this was not a normal case. I think we all know this is not a normal case. Yeah. So, um, so he's he's trying to trying to make sure, I'm sure for the purposes of any appeal that might be filed, make sure that, He's, he's dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, making sure there's no avenue that hasn't been properly covered, giving, giving certainly Craig's side um, the ability to put in documents very late that normally they wouldn't do because he wants to make sure everything's there to be, uh, to be judged up, upon. Now, uh, I'd like to just kind of go into more about this, uh, this expert evidence and talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And the... Uh, uh, the claim from we got we got Rosenthal, we got uh, we got Madden, and then we've got this professor that was talked about today as well, which mm. I forget the name about what uh, um, Mickle like, John, Mickle John, John. yes, yeah. Professor Mickle John. Now, uh, apparently, from what Wright's test own testimony on the stand over last week, and you know, it's ongoing, he he claims that uh, his expert rebuttal evidence is uh, is not is is not preferred he's got uh, a guy called Edgar Hansen he apparently that he left that to and he hired these other experts apparently that's what Wright's statement is and now he and I'm I'm not you know it's it's again it's not fair for me to say oh I read this evidence and I'm, I'm really not but I'm just going off of the what he's saying that his rebuttal evidence does not appear very strong and I'm 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 seeing that. Is that is that how you're you're reading this as well too? Where we got three reports that are potentially unrebutted or admitted to by Wright's own experts. I, I think that's where because the, one of the points I thought from from seeing your your previous videos is that there might be a misconception in how how things work in the UK compared to the US. Feel free it, to correct it, me because yeah, I was yeah. Please. But the, the way the way you were describing things working in the US is that uh, when you get to trial, like like we are now, there's a question of whether certain things are being admitted or not, whether certain things are admissible, and there's a lot of arguments about that. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure that's just not the case here. So all the things that we've, apart from this this right eleven, so this last minute addition, everything is all in. So it's already in, it's already admitted. The judge is going to decide on the basis of, of that evidence plus what's discussed in, in court. Okay. So the the the, the evidence, including the um all the written testimony uh, and all the expert reports, they're in. 
So the, there's no there's no question really of, as to whether the the Madden report or the joint report between with, with Madden and Plax, uh, where they agree on on certain issues. You know, there's a there's a there's literally a table where there's ticking boxes, uh, where they both where they both agree that you know um, they agreed on manipulation. I think the term was. So they agreed that they certain that certain documents had been manipulated. And that's to kind of narrow the focus of of the court of the trial down. So what the what the, the proceedings is trying to do is narrow it down as much as possible onto you need know, to rule out all the things that have been agreed on, and then we focus on what we disagree on, then the judge decides. And and what what Craig Wright was doing, and it, it's difficult to see some of the points he was raising. I, I was wondering. Have these been put in written evidence or not? Because if they're not in written evidence, then they're kind of they're not really of much use at all. It's just him if he's there rebutting a, a quest a, a statement or a question from from Jonathan Hoff, that and it's not in written evidence. It's kind of well, that's a bit pointless. It's not it's not going to add anything. Yeah, it's just a it's just a I say yes and you, you say no. And, and the judge is not going to put any weight on that at all. If it's if it's supported by written evidence, and if he can refer to written evidence in, that that says that, and and there's some backup to that claim, then there's there's a bit more weight. But in terms of just rebutting it on the stand, yeah, that doesn't, doesn't count. Doesn't really affect things. That's no. just the way. I think that's the main difference between. How the, how the U.S. system works, as, as far as I understand it, from well, largely from what you were saying. Well, that, that, normally I, we would be able to yeah. object to the evidence getting in. Uh, you know, when yeah. the expert, like we would potentially be able to strike it or object to it before it's before the court, and it's not necessarily admissible until the expert comes in, and maybe they're not credible. Perhaps that's not the procedure in in the U.K. So, exactly, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, and th what we what the judge has got to determine based on the what people say in court is largely whether their evidence um whether they are a reliable witness so you often see that in in uk court judgments um the judge because at first instance in the, in the high court because we've got a court of appeal and then the, the supreme court above that but at first instance there's lots of findings of fact and that's basically all we've had for the last week nearly week and a half has been these are all the findings of fact everything has been brought in and now we're discussing the findings of fact and have you got anything to say about this particular finding and and what the judge we've only heard craig so far but the, but the same will apply to the other witnesses that are going to come in as from tomorrow um the judge got to decide has got to decide based on on based on their witness's testimony whether they are reliable witness um and then that's that's where the, the point about the expert reports comes in so we've got these two experts madden and plax and i'm you know i know madden's going to come on the stand i'm, I'm pretty sure plax will be as well because he's from craig's side um so we'll have the cross-examination of the of the expert witnesses and the judge will be able to determine from that whether they are reliable witness or witnesses whether they can back up their claims um or if there's any contradictory statements they've been making, things like that. Um, and then at the end of it, with the judge you know, clearly got a lot of work to do because there's there's lots of witnesses, lots of documents to review. He's then got to come to a decision on each witness, how, how reliable they are and how much weight to give their testimony. So he's he's probably already decided what weight to give the all the written evidence or just you know take it all into account it is what it is um but um to to your point about whether whether the wit the expert testimony is is going to be admissible or not it's not quite that it's whether it's going to be relied on and, and you, the, the judge did he did make a an important point um last week when i was there when Craig was going off on, on a tangent about something. He, he tends yeah, to... he was saying the the expert's not credible and writes and and that and, and and he was saying, wait a second, you need to focus on these opinions because I'm I may be relying on these. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That that was the point I, I had in mind. Yes. So when, whenever the judge steps in like that, you know, it, it's it's the moments where you really need to pay attention to this because 
He's only stepped in a few times, but when when he does, it's an important point. Yeah. So uh, let's, you know, let me ask you about, uh, okay, we got, we've talked a little bit about the expert reports. We talked about, right, uh, you know, and and one of the things that seems to be incredibly important to write is, and they went through this with Hoff, you know, consistently, was is about right is trying, he, he, he has the need to prove his identity as Satoshi Nakamoto. And I'm wondering, you know, how is he even going to get the opportunity to do that if he's now off the stand? And and then, um, you know, Lord Gravenu just said, "Oh, we're we're done. We rest." Uh, uh, but then they did they did they say, "Well, we're going to reserve the right to call him again." I, I thought they yeah. were going to go right into redirect right there. That would what I would think. And why didn't why didn't they go What's... into? I'm not I'm not sure about what do you mean by redirect? What does that mean? Well, like uh, you had BTC Core and you know and then um, Hoff questioning right. Then normally, the attorney for right, you, you know, would get up now. You know, Gravenu. Now he's going to start questioning. Oh, okay. Yeah. Th now that that was that was to try and um, that's also why there was so much that's been done in written evidence, because in the end it it was um, decided to try and keep the because this is all supposedly going to go on for twenty days of court time, so four weeks of of all this. Uh, and to try and keep within a, a reasonable time scale, there was no direct examination. It's all cross examination. Oh, so that's why we haven't had any um, examination from Lord Grabener to Craig Wright because it's all cross examination. All of it. Uh, yeah. So I, we're I, not going to have that at all. No, because because that's it's already in. You know, all all the evidence is already in. With it's 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 part of the. You know the, the the written written evidence that's that's in play. Um, so there's nothing to nothing to add really by um, giving Craig an easy time by you know asking him some easy questions <laughs> because that's you know direct direct examination is effectively like that. It, yeah. We don't we don't have a jury to persuade, so there's no there's no need for for grandstanding and and <laughs> yeah and that's so, <laughs> yeah. All right, no grandstanding in this one. So. Because that's, well, that's, that's why you do it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Well, go... we're all watching on TV, so we think that that's what's going to happen. Obviously, that's not the case, and so I was yeah. expecting that, hoping for that to see what would happen. There'd be a, a moment, but that's not going to happen. So, sounds like we're going to go into tomorrow. They asked right today about, uh, you know, his attorney got his counsel got up and says, uh, you know, we want to have time to uh, get direction. It sounds like from right. So. Yeah. They want to find out what they what what they're going to do next, is that right? Yeah, I'm 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 not hundred percent clear on what's going to happen next. I mean, I know they've yeah. got lots of witnesses coming up, but I guess at th at that stage, Lord Grabner will will probably have more to do because he will be able to then ask ask questions, cross examine the the various expert witnesses and, and other witnesses. So that that will be a bit more a, a bit more interactive from from Wright's side because up till now we've we've it's it's been very one sided. We've all we've had is cross examination of Craig Wright for what is it is it six or seven seven days, seven days yeah yeah and you know let me ask you your opinion. Uh, I mean it's uh, well I don't, I already I just made my video for today that I'm I'm saying that Wright's in the hole you know and that he's got him dug himself kind of a hole on this. It's not over. I'm not saying it's over right now. It's not over at all. But I think that, you know, from what I've seen on the rebuttal evidence that being not potentially not being strong, it writes, right seems to be in a hole right now. I'm, I'm calling it right now, like, uh, you know, four, if I could say, if I was rating it by days, which I've been doing four for Copa, three for right. That's just my call as to how I'm seeing it on the screen. It's not the same in the court, but what, what do you, how do you feel about what's been going on so far? Um, I, I'd give I'd give the score slightly differently to you. <laughs> Probably give it seven to zero, Copa. Or would I would you, be like, has there been any chance, anything, any wins at all for right in your opinion? Uh, well, obviously I'm biased anyway, but I I don't see any. It's like a hundred nil, <laughs> half time. It's You're really seeing a, a blowout. It's a blowout. Well, I, all I will say specifically is that I know what an unsigned integer is. Okay. What's that? What's an unsigned integer? Well, you have it's a binary. It's a term to use with um, expressing numbers in binary. Okay, so you have an eight-bit binary number. T 
to define a number from usually 0 to 255. If you use one of those bits to define whether it's positive or negative, that's a signed integer. So you can get from minus 127 to plus 127. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Close enough. Um, if it's an unsigned integer, it can go from 0 to 255, but it doesn't tell you which sign it is. So there was, did, did you see Alexander Gunning asking the question? I, I don't, I'm not even sure if it was pre-planned, that question, where he was, he was talking about um, various functions in, in Bitcoin, the original software, uh, and going on about blockchain, um, check block header. I think yeah, block header. Check block header. Uh, and did you did you see the guy was sitting behind him? No, I, I did, but I didn't. Should I? What 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 would I have? I, mean, I saw a bunch of people sitting behind him. He, he was on camera, so I'm, I'm sure I can I can just say who it was. It was Peter Wooler, um, who is a one of the earliest Bitcoin developers, and he actually came up with check block header in 2012. And the point that Alexander Gunning was making was that. Craig had used the term, the same term, in a document that he said was from 2008. And mm. I, I would have liked to have been in the court to, to see the reaction from, from Copa's side on that. Wow. But, I mean, Alexander Gunning did a very, he was only there for like two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, he was fast, yeah. In total. Uh, and Jonathan Hoff was there for six and a half days grilling Craig and just, just being methodical and meticulous and going through documents and okay, I mean that you, that's I guess that you might you might be say you might be getting to your score line that way by saying well Craig responded really huh. well on certain points. Yeah, he did. I mean he's he's confident. He came across in certain points. I thought yeah he, he did very well on that. Um, doesn't mean he's necessarily scoring goals, but he, he responded. Yeah, yeah? <laughs> but, the, but Alexander Gunnings was you know I, I, and I tweeted this earlier this afternoon I thought well what what Jonathan Hoff did in six and a half days Alexander Gunning has done in 20 minutes seems like the the block so it was uh destroying the credibility of right regarding the the term block header because the guy who invented it was there in the courtroom you're saying it was the it was the use of that particular function check block header that wasn't in the original Bitcoin software so when that when it came out in January 2009, it wasn't there. So that function didn't exist. And it only came into Bitcoin software in 2012. And it was introduced thanks to Peter Wooler, who was there. So he noticed in the, the document that was supposedly from 2008 as a precursor to, to Bitcoin, this term check block header. So how, how can you have a term that's that's there before the software came in and four years before it was actually introduced. Wow. That was on a, one of the earlier documents. Is that the document that has Craig Wright's name on it? The, the white paper with his name? Which document was that? Do you remember? I didn't see which document it was. Oh. It, it, it described it as a Word, a Word document. I mean, it, it, it had metadata problems. So there was, there's an issue with the, from the Madden report and el elsewhere. But, uh, but that, was all, that was all covered by, by Hoff's questioning. So what, what the uh, Alexander Gunning was doing, he was representing the developers. And the developers clearly had their own view of their, their best their best shots were very different to the um, to COPA's shots. So COPA was meticulous, knocking down each document as being inauthentic or in a subsection of them forged, as they allege. The developers were more focused on, we don't believe Craig Wright can code. So they, they, that's why the, the questions were very pointed on, here's a particular function that didn't exist until 2012. And here's an unsigned integer. Do you know what an unsigned integer is? Uh, and I'm not a C++ coder at all. I don't, I don't even have the basics, but I would have been able to come up with a better answer than Craig did. Mm. And that, that, that from, from, his, from his side, I, that's, that would be really concerning. Sounds like that's why Co uh, BTC Core rested so fast. I mean, they were they got that in, and then they were I, they were out. I I think it was because they they were always going to be the, the sort of minor partner in in this. So, um, Copa took the the lion's share of the cross examination. I think that was that was just the plan. Mm -hmm.
So let me ask you this. What would the effect of the case be if, okay, if, you know, the, the let's just say that the, the, the possibility that Wright goes ahead and, and proves possession of the keys for the Genesis block, what would the effect, what would that, how would that affect the case? Like he goes and gets in, I don't know how it would happen if he's not going to be crossed by his own attorney. I, I don't even know how, when, when would the opportunity even happen? You know, if it could, it sounds like it procedurally. If he has the private key yeah. corresponding to the public key in the Genesis block, which yeah. she, she said doesn't exist. So maybe it would have to be block nine. Yeah. So, okay. Block nine. Sounds so like the block nine, block nine is the one that, that created the Bitcoin that was the first transaction from Satoshi to Hal Finney. So every, everyone kind of focuses on block nine for that reason, because it's a it's a known transaction from Satoshi to someone, like the, the very first one. So it's kind of iconic for that. If, if, he, if he could show that he had the private key corresponding to the public key that's in block nine, and, and you can do that simply by just, you know, signing signing a message saying i am craig wright and i'm the owner of this public key simple as that uh, if it's a verified signed message fine we can we can all go home and go okay you're satoshi well maybe it's not as simple as that but um he would have to get it admitted as as evidence i mean it's a bit late <laughs> that is very, probably far too late and he's not done it to date so i don't think he's going to do it now but that, that's really the, the only the only get out for, for Craig, I think, is, you know, sign is what everyone's been telling him is what Calvin Ayer has been telling him. If we're to believe the emails, but just just come out and sign. I don't know what I think to paraphrase what Calvin was saying. I don't know what game you've been playing, but you really need to sign now. And that was from a few months ago. So if he did that, then, you know, it would change the game completely. So procedurally speaking, is there an opportunity for that? In the case, with, with something if he wanted to, yeah, it, with something as bombshell as that, I, I think it it would be brought in. Okay, okay, because maybe maybe he's waiting. Seems like with the way he has as a personality, he's been very emotional up there about saying, "I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it till death does part." Pretty yeah. clear about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't have made it clearer. It was, yeah, it goes off on ramps. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was what was it Jonathan Opp described a digressive rant that was a, a good term he, he he came up with today well you notice at the end today I I made just talk about this in my video today which was um Jonathan Hoff started using I think this was a handicap he started saying oh I don't want you to be careful I don't want you to talk about privileged information to get to, right yeah. to stop talking <laughs> after a while it was like oh be careful. Anybody well, start. There's, a, there's a few <laughs> phrases that we're, we're all now familiar with. You know, I'll, I'll just pause you there. Let me stop you there. Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. yeah he, he had a lot to get through. So, you know, you can see, you can imagine how frustrated he was inside. I would have been. I'm not, yeah. sure, I could, I'm not sure I'd have kept my cool for seven days like that. But it's, it's quite impressive. It was, it was, it was, it's been an impressive case overall, but it's been amazing. So, you know, well, uh, would you, would you be uh, against coming back on and, you know, giving a, giving another, you know, kind of a recap and evaluation on this in a, in the coming weeks? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back into court in person You're... on Friday. Oh, you are. So okay. That'll be just, just to say, say goodbye to Norbert, really. I, I don't know if you've been following Norbert on Twitter. No. Norwegian guy, friend of Huddle Knots. Is a, is a great fella, and he types like lightning. <laughs> he, he just typing like almost like a transcript throughout the day. Um, yeah, and and I, I was friendly with him last week, and we went out for drinks. And he's he's, he's a fantastic guy. So uh, it'd be nice to see him again. But after that, I'm I'm back to work from next Monday. So oh. I'm not I'm not going to be able to follow this as closely as I have been these Got it. two. Okay, well, I'll send you an email in a few weeks and see how you're doing, um, because uh, you know, and I know you're probably once you get your head back into your your uh, your cases there, you're going to be super busy. So, well, I've I've got I've got a pile of patent drafting work to do. That's that. Um, yeah, <laughs> I need to get on with that and and start doing some proper work. Um, well, definitely, uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens here, and then uh, ultimately, if if something happens with these end chain patents, you know. And so, yeah, 
Well, I'll be watching. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, all right, well then I'll, I'll send you out another email, you know, and just kind of keep in touch in a couple of weeks and, you know, we'll see if uh, we could maybe put something back on the calendar in the future and, you know, touch base. So, oh, and by the way, where can people find you on Twitter? I know you're on Twitter. You are posting. How do they find you? Yeah. Well, I'm at Tufty the cat, all one word. Simple as that. Okay. At Tufty the cat, uh, at Tufty the cat on Twitter. On Twitter. Yeah. And there's yeah. a link to my blog as well. I've written a few blog posts on asp IP aspects of this leading up to this case. So if if anyone's interested in finding out about more, more about the database rights or the Bitcoin file format or you know, other patenting, patent related things, um, they're on my blog as well. Nice. Well, this is really awesome. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm. Uh, I'll go ahead and end the end the recording there, and we can chat a little a little bit longer. I greatly appreciate your time, and it was, uh, you know, super an honor, privilege to have you on today. Thanks for your perspective. Well, thank you. It's, it's All been right. A pleasure. I'll All see right. you at the top. All right.